So hi, everyone. I'm Angela Shanshe. I'm the Director of Data Innovation and Predicting Human Behavior in Telefonica. It is our great pleasure to have Kathy O'Neill, a mathematician, data scientist, and the author of Weapons of Math Destruction, How Big Data Increases Inequality and Threatens Democracy. And thank you for coming to Telos Forum which is a series of panel discussions uh, to promote the changes we are experiencing through the eyes of different leading global thinkers. Um, so this year's TELUS Forum is called A New World Under Construction, and we will try to rethink tomorrow, reinvent the future, search for a new social model that makes the world a fairer and more humane place and, um, and look for where technological tools can become essential partners. So uh, Kathy O'Neill is, as I said, a data scientist and the author of also the math blog, mathbabe.org. And she earned a PhD in mathematics from Harvard and taught at Barnard College before moving to the private sector where she worked for the hedge fund D.E. Shaw. She then worked as a data scientist at various startups, building models that predict uh, people's purchases and clicks. Um, and O'Neill started the lead program in data journalism at Columbia and is the author of Doing Data Science. So, hi, Kathy. I am so pleased to be talking with you and welcome. Thank you, Angela. Such a pleasure to be here. And I want to warn you that um, I have a new puppy, so if you hear squeaks, that's him biting on his little monkey squeak toy, and I apologize for that. <laughs> we welcome all squeaks and puppies, always. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> <with> life, hashtag. <laughs> so I know that you've already been in the Espacio Fundación Telefónica in um, 2018, yeah. um, but I'm going to start you off with a question about this moment in 2020. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you have an idea of what's coming. <laughs> So the coronavirus pandemic has given mathematical models um, and mathematical data a very important role that it can potentially save people's lives. And um, I think of it in a way that um, it's, it's, it's been math over medicine thus far. Um, and if we better understand the data and more realistic expectations, we could, we could establish more realistic expectations, um, make better decisions and better predict the path of deceit. But um, just a few <laughs> can understand the inner mechanisms of the different mathematical models. And, and um, I'd like to um, know how you think governments can be trained to learn how these models work and therefore be able to make better decisions on movement restrictions and um, purchase of you know personal protective equipment and things like that, which involve millions and millions of people. Yeah, it's a question I've been grappling with since March. I was living in Manhattan during the beginning of the terrible epicenter of uh, of the epidemic there, um, and I've been following the data as you can imagine uh, very very closely. Um, very early on, uh, I've been writing for Bloomberg Opinion about like the ways I don't trust the data um, at all. But at the same time, data is not totally useless. Like trends in data are still interesting, even if you don't trust the data collection mechanism, because you're like, well, the data collection mechanism is as bad as it was yesterday. So if things are getting worse, then things are probably getting worse. You know, if, if the data looks worse, then the pro things are probably getting worse. I just have to remember to multiply all these numbers by something like 10, like some fudge factor, um, in terms of like how many cases do we actually know about versus how many cases are there actually, that kind of thing. Those fudge factors have changed over time. So, you know, whereas I used to think we got maybe 10% of cases, now I think we're getting more than that, but it's still, you know, not half of it. Um, so it's probably more like a fudge factor of three. So, you know, when you see sort of trends over t long periods of time, like since March, you know, Right now, for example, it's a high of cases, but it pro of re of confirmed cases by testing, but it's probably not actually a high of actual cases. Um, but it is trending in the wrong direction. So trends are always useful. Um, so the data itself, I could go on for, like for a half an hour. I won't do that. Um, but there's lots of ways that we know the data is wrong and it's flawed. 
Um, and then the question you asked me though was about models. And what I find really fascinating is I've actually come to a pretty strong conclusion over the last few months about the utility of models in public health. And it is not the conclusion that I would have imagined I would draw. Um, and my conclusion is essentially that models should not be used for public health measures. Um, Fascinating. And when, let me let me defend that a little bit. Um, I absolutely insist that biologists, the people working on vaccines, the people trying to understand exactly how um, the disease is spread, is it aerosol, is it droplets, that kind of thing. They all need models in their labs. They need their experiments. They need to be doing experiments. Important. That's that's scientific endeavor. Scientific testing needs modeling because that's how you learn um, by testing models. Um, there's other examples of how we do need modeling. We even need modeling to understand sort of epidemiologically how things spread. What we don't need models for and what we've seen models be very ill used for is uh, communicating with the public. Um, I, since I lived in Manhattan, I was, uh, you know, watching Governor Cuomo's week daily press conferences where behind him on like this huge sticky pad, there would be like these curves and they would be bell curves, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, importantly. Um, and that would be, the idea would be there that like once it peaks, it will start going down again. It'll go back to zero, like whatever it is, whether there was the cases, hospitalizations, deaths, whatever, it was always framed as a bell curve. And as you, since you, since you use the word expectation, I immediately realized that is the setting up the, the, exactly the wrong expectation. Number one, that uh, it's going to go back to zero because obviously it never did and it's going back up again. So that curve was just misleading because the idea that it would go back to zero at, you know, at any time soon is crazy. But more specifically, the idea that it would go back to zero as quickly as it came up. So like if you could have measured the time between like the, the first day and the worst day, then that if that was like an eight week period or a six week period, then another period exactly the same length, it would go back to zero. Like that, it was just simply setting the worst possible expectations. Now, I knew a little bit about um, the models themselves as, and I, because I looked into it, um, talked to other mathematicians who are suddenly very curious about epidemiological modeling. I understand why they were using bell curves. It was wrong and it sent the absolutely wrong m message the wrong expectations. But if you don't mind me answering this question one more in one more direction, what I realized is that, and this is what I wrote about in Weapons of Math Destruction, people are silenced by mathematically sophisticated models. Um, they feel like because they're not PhDs in mathematics themselves, they don't have the right to question it because it's, you know, science. And it has this uh, sort of badge of authority. Um, and so they don't ask questions. And what that does is it separates the average person, it, the average public uh, person in public from the actual uh, epidemic. And so my feeling now is that um, having those bell curves behind, I, I'm sure Cuomo did it because he wanted to give the impression that he had, he was, it, things were under control. Yeah. 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 yeah, we know what to expect. Here we are. We're doing it professionally. Instead, what it did was it separated um, it separated people from the results of the, the, the epidemic. And I think what a much, much more useful public health message would have been would have been to say, uh, honestly, we don't know exactly how this spreads. We don't know exactly what you should do to protect yourself and your family. Wash your hands. Um, which we have spent far too much time talking about washing your, the people's hands. Um, but we'll know more in the near future as we learn more. In the meantime, all we can tell you is that it's going to depend on you. It's going to depend on your behavior. Um, and it's not going to depend on mathematics. <laughs> it's not going to depend on a model. It's going to depend on individual behavior. And I feel like if that message had been much more clear, I mean, of course, we didn't know to wear masks back then. Now we do. But because we wasted so much time talking abstractly about models instead of very concretely about behavior, 
um, it was a real lost opportunity. And it gave me the overall impression that models, instead of helping, they actually made people feel um, not directly connected to the solution of how to deal with the epidemic. So it was a mistake. Interesting. Um... One of the other things that I, I think um, I, I've seen from working in business in analytics is that when you communicate, communicating the data is is a huge part of of a huge part of the the, the challenge. It's a huge part of the process, and um, even executives, like as you say, they they if they can't question the model. Um, <laughs> You know, the other the other option is to just not no, one option is not question it at all. The other option is just to deny it's it's uh, it, that it has any um, uh, basis in reality or it's, it's real, um, mm -hmm. which which we've seen here in the U.S. Um, yeah. So so how do you think um, uh, could 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 these models be unpacked? Could we take them out of the black box? What kinds of things could could we've done to to make them more understandable, both to governments and um, policymakers and to individuals? Well, yeah, and that's a really good question um, because I don't think we should just throw up our hands and not and and take nothing from all the models because there are very useful things that we could take from models without asking anyone to believe in a specific model um, right. or to believe right. specific, very corrupt, right. possibly even politically biased data. Right. Uh, I've been following, by the way, as an aside, I've been following like how Florida is reporting deaths and even now they're manipulating and slow walking death reports simply because they don't want, some days they just don't want bad news so that they just withhold data mm -hmm. and it's like messed up. Mm -hmm. So there is a real reason for the public trust to be broken. <laughs> but having said all that, um, I did a study, a little survey of like the different kinds of models. And, and I found it fascinating that different models um, focused on different aspects of, um, of spread, of contagion. And mm. so like, one of them focused on super spreaders, really, really important um, issue. Like who is networked? Who's like in the center of a network mm. and like, capable if not likely um to spread much much more efficiently a, a a virus than than somebody who is mostly socially isolated hugely important question yeah. to be asking and to be keeping in mind another example is a model that um that um sort of measured people's propensity to travel from place to place so that the bug would be somehow stochastically um more or less likely to spread from city to city, depending on how many people were traveling. Also a really interesting way of thinking about how quickly things can spread from place to place. And part of, it's not that different from super spreaders, but mm -hmm. it is different. Mm -hmm. um, real sort of, at the end of the day, an explanation for the extent to which the South Dakota motorcycle rally um, really seemed to affect the entire upper Midwest um, mm -hmm. in terms of mm -hmm. eventual spread. And mm -hmm. now we see North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, all those places, Wisconsin, in such red zones now, mm -hmm. um, probably as a long-term result of that uh, and, and of other things. But uh, anyway, so the different models kind of had different approaches to thinking mm -hmm. about spread. And I think those approaches are super interesting and important and they're vernacular. There's no sophistication. Right, you can that. understand that. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. So we right. can still we can still hold on to those things that are easily communicated with the public and never never require mm -hmm. notation or spreadsheets mm -hmm. or graphs. Right, um, and we should right. do that. Right, and people could understand that. I mean, models are they are just what they're called. They're 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 just models where exactly. they're trying to predict things, and some are designed to uh, prioritize or weight certain certain kinds of uh, factors and um and understanding the model that the data is coming from would be pretty helpful yeah that's yeah. A, that's, a, that's a great idea um one other issue that this brings up um uh is privacy because some of that data even what you were just talking about in terms of networking that's something that you know a, a, a telco can provide 
yes. important data into, but there are you know big privacy concerns. And uh, right now the EU is, is tackling big challenges around privacy and the use of data and artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, can you give your thoughts on, on, on what you think the role of government and policy should be to address the kinds of problems and inequities that you talk about in your book? Right. Well, here, I'm going to answer a slightly different question, if you don't mind. Okay. And the question is like, why I never thought that a contact and tracing app would ever work in the United States. Um, mm -hmm. And it's going to touch on that. But um, before it even was attempted, and it has been attempted by lots of different people, I knew it wasn't going to work. Um, and partly it's privacy, um, but it, it's mostly about, it's really about class. So, um, what, you know, so there was this idea, there were multiple ideas about Bluetooth, um, you know, download this Bluetooth app, it's opt-in and it's privacy preserving. And like, you'll be notified if someone who you were in close contact with um, was, uh, was had a confirmed case and reported it to the app. There's a lot of if statements in there. Yeah. Um, and it just led me to the question of like, when would this work, you know? Mm -hmm. Because I can think of a million reasons it wouldn't work. Um, mm -hmm. And a few of them are, um, you know, people who have to go to work on the subway mm -hmm. for their living, uh, the, the, the frontline service workers, um, uh, which there were quite a, quite a few in New York City, especially early on, they don't want to know that they just got exposed because mm -hmm. it's only bad mm -hmm. news. They can't, they can't do anything about it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and they would never download that app because another thing is if they mm -hmm. were told to quarantine, they would lose their job, you know? So it's like, there's so many different reasons and they actually also, many of them are undocumented and are very, very worried about um, privacy violations in particular for this with respect to their documentation status, mm -hmm. um, their immigration status. So, I mean, just making the point that like, there's a whole swath of population, subpopulation at the time in New York, but overall of people who actually need the money, who live like on a daily basis off their, um, off their daily um, existence, off their, off their wage or work um, that simply can't afford to quarantine. And so, I mean, I guess the meta point is that a contact tracing app assumes that people, if told that they had been put at risk, would stay home for two weeks. <laughs> so like that assumes that people have that mm -hmm. luxury. And a lot of people just simply don't. Mm -hmm. And then it lets to the question of like, well, where are contact tracing apps working? Or where are measures such as contact tracing apps working? Right. And the answer I came up with was basically repressive regimes like China, where they like force you to quarantine. Mm -hmm. And then places where people actually trusted the government, like mm -hmm. in Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, right. They actually, there was trust. And moreover, there was like, you don't just get told to stay home, you get paid to stay home. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, okay. So those problems go away because either you have mm -hmm. no choice mm -hmm. uh, or you actually, they make it possible for you to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and having said that, like Singapore wasn't mm -hmm. early story but then I kept my eye on it and later on it found I found out that like there was a sort of subclass of non-citizens in Singapore the guest workers who were like all staying in dorms and weren't really being contact traced um, and in particular they weren't going to get paid if they got sick so guess what mm -hmm. they did they didn't quarantine because they needed the money so it's like it's really pretty predictable and it does have to do with privacy, uh, Angela, but it's not just about privacy. Mm -hmm. it, I think privacy, at the end of the day, and this is my critique of privacy mm -hmm. um, considerations, yeah. is that privacy is a luxury. And it's a luxury past getting fed on, on a daily basis. So we have to, we have to first, and it's just true for all kinds of algorithmic harm. We have to first think about people meeting their basic needs, and then we can think about privacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. So, so I think also what you're saying is that the ability of governments to, to act is you have to ask what can they actually do? Because the problem goes beyond just that first node of, 
okay, stay home. Don't, you know, don't, don't stay home. Um, there's many more things that have to be enabled um, and yeah. much more complex. What do they persuade or coerce mm -hmm. average people to do? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And if the answer is neither very much at all, then it's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> just, just a little extension of this privacy since we're on this topic. So, so, uh, you know, I kind of see that there's a, a flip side of privacy also, because in, in general, you know, we think that more private data is a good, is a good thing, but, but also to make data more private, we are, we're introducing more manipulation of the data. Like for instance, differential privacy, which adds noise into yeah. data as a way of obscuring, you know, personal identification. So is this something that you think we should be worried about and can truly private anonymized data actually be better than, than hyper targeted or hyper, uh, um, specific data. Yeah. Um, yes and no, I'm okay. going to give you two different contexts where the answer is a definite yes. And another context where it's a definite no. <laughs> um, yeah, so I definitely think that targeted political ads are bad for democracy. I made that case in Weapons of Math Destruction. Yes. My opinion of it has only grown stronger. Yes. Um, you know, we've seen voter suppression ads targeting African Americans. We see emotionally manipulative and in, in, misinformative ads um, targeting people that are vulnerable to conspiracy theories and, you know, other kinds of misinformation and propaganda. It is a problem. Um, and it's a specific problem because they would never dare show that to me, right? Um, they don't mm -hmm. dare show it to people that are invulnerable to that or would take offense by it. So they figure this out and it's really doable and possible and it happens and that's a problem for democracy. So my claim is political ads should be only banner ads randomly just shown to random people. Like I don't think targeting should be legal in the context mm -hmm. of politics. Mm. I think I think you should be like, oh, you want to do an ad? Great. It's an ad that everyone will see with some probability. Everyone on this mm -hmm. platform. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm arguing that that would be better for democracy. It would obviously be a yes. lot less efficient for political campaigns um, because they love this technology, but it's not mm -hmm. whatever. Just because it's efficient for them doesn't mean it's good for democracy. Yeah. And I can imagine a lot of loopholes there because... Yeah because a lot of political ads are not positioned or written as political ads. They, Correct. they, you know, target some kind of an issue, um, yeah. Yeah. to some set of information that may right. or may and not it, like, for example, happen. if you just are just, what if you have an advertisement that's really about black lives matter? Um, either depicting them as right. freedom fighters or as thugs. Like, is that politics? Not directly, right. only indirectly. So it's a very good point. Right. Um, but by the way, Angela, I'd be okay with all ads being banner ads. Uh, I think ta tailored advertising, hmm. you know what I mean? It's, it's, it is it's the lifeblood of the internet, but that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, so I agree with you though, that's, that would be hard to implement. The second example I wanted to give you though is is an argument um, against sort of the anonymization of and the uh, sort of blurring uh, the blurring of 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 of, of exact data. Um, mm -hmm. So you talked about differential privacy. I, I understand that that is that may or may not. I'm not exactly sure. Be uh, implemented for the sake of um, for the sake of uh, census data. Um, in the near future. Okay. So we might not be able to get the actual census data anymore. We're mm. going to get some kind of blurred census data, which is to say that some of the data has been um, uh, randomized for the sake of um, protecting privacy. And I can understand the argument for it. Um, that's my puppy, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, let me let me tell you what I use census data for. Um, in my role yeah. as an algorithmic auditor, I use census data um, when there is no race data available to infer race with this, what, what's called the BISG methodology. It's not perfect, um, but it's not that bad. What it does is it says, what's your last name? What's your address? And then based on your address and your last name and census data, 
I'm, uh, which does have race attached to last to to, to, to census tracts. Um, I so let me say there's two data sets I use. One is an overall data set that relates last names to race, mm -hmm. and another one is an overall data set that relates address to census data, which includes race. Mm -hmm. So given these two pieces of information about you, I can infer pretty well what your race is. Mm -hmm. Why do I use that? Because I often have those two pieces of information, your last name and your address, but I don't know your race. So if I'm trying to figure out whether like a credit card company is behaving, uh, their algorithms are behaving in a non-discriminatory way, that's super useful. To finish that point off, um, once my census data has been submitted to the differential privacy um, uh, sort of filtering effect, it's my, my algorithm inferring race is going to get worse. It's going to, you know, it's already not that perfect. It's going to mm -hmm. get worse. Mm -hmm. um, that means my, and when I, when it gets worse, that means my ability to detect racism in algorithms mm -hmm. is going to go down. Mm -hmm. Race, actual racist um, behavior by algorithms will look less racist. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the problem yeah. for my work, but it's also just, a, I think it's a problem for justice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, those are two answers to your question. And uh, the meta answer I would say uh, is that I always find this to be the case, that there are no principles that are always true. There's yeah. always a context where a principle is true yeah. and another context where the principle is false, which is yeah. why you will not see my name signed onto any AI ethics principle list. Because mm -hmm. I've never seen principles that are abstract enough for me to agree to or specific yeah. enough for me to find um, true, because of course principles aren't specific. Anyway, it's a, it's, it's a meta point, which is that like, this stuff is very nuanced. Yes. Uh, and it's very, very difficult to make a statement that's, that's, a, that's almost like a philosophical statement that you can actually agree to. Yes, I, I agree. Um, um, it, as you may know in Europe, um, uh, these kinds of principles have been have been drafted, and um, I had some 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 tangential involvement um, with it, and have commented on it. And it's um, it, you just keep coming up with different use cases which can fall on either side. Yes, exactly my point. Exactly my yeah. point. Couldn't have said it better. You know, another 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 topic. Um, is um, what I call data monopolies. So, yeah. for instance, you know, you touched on advertising and you talk about advertising a lot in your book. Um, um, you know, it seems like Google and Facebook and Amazon know everything about us. And with the monopoly on the data, um, it is conceivable that they can have a monopoly on artificial intelligence. And so um, Google, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Apple, Microsoft, you know, have been buying, um, have been on a buying spree of, of AI technology companies. And, and also every AI's uh, startup's exit strategy is to be acquired by one of those companies. That's true. That's true. Um, so we saw Google do this with robotics in 2012, and they went on a huge buying spree, bought up all the robotics companies. Um, and I could liken it to the car companies buying all the electric car technology in the 60s and 70s. Um, so, you know, how, how do you see this playing out? And do you think that it's a threat, data monopolies? Yeah, it is absolutely a threat and it's almost inevitable. Um, and I would like, mm. instead of worrying about how to use antitrust tools to break it up. I mean, it was, mm. so there so, should be people that do that. That's not my, my, my bag, like, um, go for it. If you can figure out how to break it up, do it. I would postulate though, that that wouldn't mm. necessarily solve the problem. Um, one of the things I've realized through my um, through my work of uh, as a researcher and an auditor of algorithms is that a lot of the problems that we find in algorithms are not really monopoly problems. They are data problems that are inherent in any 
buddy who's doing this. So that, the example I gave you earlier of like a credit card company using racist credit card practices, um, small in startup credit card companies are racist. They're all, it be, it's because like the world is racist. Like the data they collect, even though it's not big data, maybe, maybe it's not, not Google like size data, but it is reflecting our society, which is racist. And it is sort of financially segregative, segregative to, you know, African-Americans. So they are going to end up propagating that racism in their own data, unless they do something to stop it. Uh, my point being that you don't need a monopoly on data to have data that reflects our society. You know what I mean? Like, so they end up acting in concert with each other, not because they are conspiring or because they're part of a monopoly, but because they're all just doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. They're all just optimizing profit and following the history. Hmm. Um, and like, whether that means, um, they're, you know, it can mean a lot of things, but one, one thing it means, for example, is that like redlining has a historical, um, echo, um, you know, and, and the fact that people in, um, in certain neighborhoods are charged too much for cars and for their subprime auto loans, that great example is, from your book. Of yeah, how it happens, mm -hmm. and it gives uh, it gives precedent and historic historical precedent and and legal precedent for other companies to do that in the future, um, which is profitable. And so, if they're optimizing to profit, they're going to just keep following these same trends. It doesn't need a monopoly. So, I just want to make that point in the first place. The second point I'll make is like power is going to power. Like Amazon is going to be the only company pretty soon. Like it's going to happen. So what we need to do instead of thinking, how do we make them powerless or less or small, which is, I don't, I mean, again, maybe I'm not a lawyer, so maybe that's possible. Mm -hmm. But another way of thinking about it is like, well, why don't we just actually make them treat their employees well, mm -hmm. treat the supply chain with care and, and, um, you know, follow rules. Like instead of, in other words, instead of trying to cut them down to size, which again, like if you think about cutting them down to size, what that is premised on is that we believe that a free market is a perfect situation. But what I just described to you is that a free market in the case of racist data is not a perfect situation. You need rules that constrain people with respect to certain kinds of um, discrimination. So I guess my point is, I would like just to think, Okay, let's assume everything's a monopoly. What are the rules that they should follow anyway? Mm -hmm. To make it tolerable to live in this world, given that Amazon's the only um, consumer company and Apple's the only phone company and Google's the only information company and Facebook is the only social company. Like, assuming they complete, when they complete their monopolies, what are the rules that they would have to follow that would make this world a, like a worthy place to live? Hmm. And then force them to follow the rules. Hmm. Um, like that's still possible, hmm. even if they're monopolies. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So that's the way I'm going to think about it. And the, the way hmm. to be more precise about that, what I mean by that is, you know, they, they, so for a payday lending or something, you you're, you have to look at somebody's ability to pay. You have to follow the usury rates in every in this, in the given location, you have to um, not put people into debt spirals. There are lots of rules uh, that with precedent that we can force any lending company to follow that makes lending an opportunity rather than a, uh, like a, a death spiral. And I really think like, if we just made the rules work for us and work for society, then the monopoly aspect of it might not be as bad. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm going to sound very American here on this um, uh, European uh, <laughs> um, uh, conversation. But, um, but I think also to be able to offer alternatives to the customers of those companies. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, specifically, I would say around things like advertising, which powers um, uh, many of those, the biggest companies in the world, providing alternatives uh, can be can be 
can be a way to naturally reduce the the, the, the sort of the monopolization. Well, yes, but you're talking about reducing monopolization. My point is that I'm going to, I refuse to consider monopolization as a problem in and of itself. I can, I consider harm to be a problem in and of itself. So let's reduce harm hmm. and yeah. ignore monopolization. And I'm not well, saying monopolization has no inherent harm. It's not my claim. I'm just saying that there are I plenty see. of problems yes. that, we, yes. that we can address and anticipate and then address yeah. that really have nothing to do with monopolization. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was making a leap there yeah. <laughs> because, uh, because, because of, for instance, the harm that comes from, uh, from making so much money and being dependent on the attention of users. So they've created an attention economy and the things, particularly algorithms that are used to keep our attention yes. have created all kinds of unintended consequences. But Angela, that's exactly my point. We could make rules about the ways they're allowed to draw our attention. Mm -hmm. We could make rules about the kind of um, misinformation that they're allowed yeah. to leave, or especially the kinds of editorialization they're allowed to do and the way they privilege misinformation with mm -hmm. the algorithms. Yes. We can make rules against that. Yes. Um, let me put it another way. Like when I was an occupier after the financial crisis, I joined Occupy Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Like I was, you know, really, uh, I was really alarmed by the way that the banks messed everything up and then got saved and then didn't learn their lesson. Um, and I was like, well, we need better rules for the banks. But I I was actually kind of an, um, undecided between two, two totally different models. And one of them is break up the banks, make them small, make them local. And the other one is, which would reduce their power of collusion, et cetera. And the other one was like nationalize them, make them really boring make them like enormous, but unbelievably restricted with rules. And I'm still okay with the nationalized version of things. I would like to nationalize Amazon, by which I mean, just make it so boring. Mm -hmm. I mean, but everyone can use it, but it's really mm -hmm. boring. And there's lots of rules it has to follow. Mm -hmm. Would Amazon's founders, uh, you know, would mm -hmm. the, what's his name like that? No, I don't care. Um, it could be just described as a national um, requirement. It's, an, it's a national utility to be able to buy things on the platform. Retail banking. Retail banking. Why not make it a postal bank, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the way Holland still has and we once had. Like, make it really boring mm -hmm. and there's a bank at every post office. Like, why not? The point is that that is monopolistic when you nationalize something as, as a service, but it's not threatening. So my claim is, if we can't break it up, then bo make it boring. Hmm. <laughs> um, uh, so you 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 mentioned your you know time in Wall Street and and in your in your book uh, you talk about this sort of path to disillusionment and and um, I think paint a picture of like for instance the. 2008 financial crisis, um, how how much how far removed the 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 people who were who were making money in these markets were from from the reality and and I'd say for myself that I I remember back then having a conversation with with a friend of mine who was looking to buy a house. Um, an apartment in New York, and she uh, said uh, that she had been told to just get the biggest mortgage possible. Like she could, you know, she could afford it. So, you know, that was the the sort of prevailing uh, guidance. Yeah, like, get the biggest one possible because you're going to make more money. The house is going to, you know, gain value and all, you know, and all of that. Um, uh, and, and how did that work out for your friend? What's that? How did that, how did that plan work out for your friend? Um, <laughs> she ended up also taking out a, uh, one of those mortgages where you don't pay down any of the principal interest only mortgages. And, um, she didn't, she didn't, she didn't end up 
too far underwater, but but you know she didn't end up um, uh, uh, you know at, at a gain either. But mm -hmm. but what it told me at that time was wow, there's something kind of weird going on here where you know where where uh, people can qualify for wow really big mortgages and they're and they're being urged to take them out. And that's like what's happening right, like on the ground. And I'm, and I'm, I'm wondering how do you, how do you close that gap? I mean, did anybody? Uh, you know, I'm curious. Did did people on Wall Street understand that? I mean, it's not that hard to follow in in hindsight the the path that this took. You know, more predatory mortgage uh, lenders. You know, the the lots of people were, become, were becoming more mortgage brokers at that time because there was so much money in it. Um, I, how do you how do you close that gap between way up here with lots and lots of numbers and math and models in between you and and what's actually happening on the ground to people? I mean, what you're describing is is the essential problem of inequality, you know, and the uh, the essential problem of, of runaway inequality <laughs> is is uh, is that it becomes more and more difficult to imagine closing that gap. Um, solve this problem. You know, when I was when I, when I was working at the hedge fund, my my friend was my friend who was a housekeeper managed to have uh, more than two hundred thousand dollars in debt. But she, you know, she signed, she signed, you know, it was a car payment and motorcycle payment and credit cards. And, you know, it's like, and, and these were not old debts, you know, like she had gotten this ridiculously expensive car and gotten a loan for it recently and wasn't going to be able to pay for any of that, you know? And in, in the meantime, I would go back to my hedge fund by day and the, they would voice concern among the mortgage, the managing directors that the um, the very much reduced rate of carried interest for tax purposes might be raised to be the same as the income tax rate. And like how horrible a punishment that would have been when all they were doing was making the market more efficient. Like they had their ready-made excuses for why they needed to remain mm -hmm. multimillionaires and not be blamed for anything. Um, and I just remember that juxtaposition of like my friend crying on my lap on a daily basis with my boss's bosses talking about how they deserve their their lowered tax rates. And I was just like, yeah, this is not a connected world. Hmm. Um, and there are very few people seemingly that are that really can make that connection. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's. It's what joined, what forced me to join Occupy. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, in a nutshell, it, it was that it was outrageous. It was an outrageous um, mismatch between people who were like, "Of course, I'm going to um, plunder the mortgage market for as good as good as I can for as long as I can, and make as much money as I can." And then, when it all goes to crap, I will join in the in the new market of people. Who need to sell their house at a loss so that I can, you know, build up a private equity firm to like own the rental market in the future, especially in jurisdictions where like rental laws are weak. You know, it's like it, it's just like how can I take advantage of the next situation? I'm going to start planning now um, to make money. The, it it presumes, of course, a kind of agility, a kind of like umbrella coverage. I don't need a job every year i could take a couple years off live off my savings and plan my next um my next con but that is essentially what is going on at the highest level of finance mm. well that's certainly um uh the feeling from being outside of it <laughs> yeah it's not wrong it's not wrong <laughs> um so so i'm gonna try to see if uh if i can um find some hope here. <laughs> oh, great. Me too. Me too. So, um, you know, you, you, you talked about advertising and you have a great example of the, 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 
the bad things that can happen with you know hyper targeting in in your book you have an example of uh, for profit for profit universities and um, how they use digital targeting so um, uh, in, in my experience I see that there's a spectrum in this in that in that world between okay they know nothing about me and um, I'm seeing ads for beer and trucks and fast food and they're spying on me and I have a target on my back on the other hand um, but somewhere in between there I like to think that there is a personalized experience where I'm introduced to new things and advertising is useful content and I recently did have uh, an experience of this that was so good that I actually had a notebook next to me where I was taking down the names of these 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 companies. Um, so, you know, do you think that 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 sweet spot can be found? And you know, you know, how do we fix this very broken model? Mm. And by the way, I'm glad you had had a good experience. Um, I also have good experiences, by the way, I get, I might've mentioned this in my book, I get like turned on to new luxury yarns all the time. I'm like a sucker for like jewel toned cashmere merino blends, you know? <laughs> and when I find one of those or they find me, it, it is a pleasure. It's like, oh, that's what I wanted to look at. I didn't want to think about bad things happening today. Um, yeah. I use as an, what's that? I, I, I use as an example sometimes that when I was a kid, uh, I bought Vogue magazine, I bought car magazines, and they're all ads. And as was part of the part of what you were buying. Now we didn't yeah. think about it in that way, but um, and and I don't want to go back, you know, go back to the age of Mad Men. But there, but there is, you know, there is something um, that can be. You know beneficial and and it does make it is what right now is making the keeping the internet free yeah and for that matter like i'm kind of a clothes horse and i like i like the sense that like my tastes are being uh adhered to and and mm. flattered um and oh yeah they they came out with this line just for me it feels that way and that that's nice it's flattering mm. um of course mm. i do have to keep in mind that the reason that whole machine is is active to please me is because I have spending money. Um, and they are ultimately doing it for the money, <laughs> not for my pleasure. I mean, their side effect, my pleasure, good, but like they want the money. Um, and then it, and then when you extend that to the rest of the population, who, many of who, uh, you know, the people in, in that population don't have as much spending money as I do. Um, you have to realize that, well, how are they going to extract money from those people? And um, me, because ultimately they, they don't care about my pleasure. They care about the money uh, to say it again. Although when you say they, I mean, there's, there's a whole machine, as you know, yes. Um, yes. Of, of digital advertising with yes. many, many middlemen who yes. didn't need to exist. Um, on one hand though, there are the publishers who you know, many are very le legitimate and are providing a, a valuable service. And then there are advertisers who are, are are brands and product producers from, you know, small, you know, uh, Etsy like things to um, to big conglomerates. Um, when you talk about they, do you mean everyone or you you <laughs> you mean um, I do think there's some choice. Uh, you know, I think the people that work at Etsy aren't the same people that worked at the University of Phoenix. Uh, you know, yeah. um, yes. Uh, I, w but ultimately, they're in business, and like the when I when I'm talking about they, I'm talking about the machine that is that is consumer America and for profit mm -hmm. America. You know, um, the and, and I I agree with you that these are valid concepts, like. I mean, Facebook is its own machine, right? Let's let's focus on the Google ad platform or the Facebook ad platform. Either way, there's auctions, there's ad auctions, and then there are these, you know, P 
people, uh, the advertisers that are basically paying for your attention, like for the opportunity to get their wares in front of you. It's, it's great when they are like, we have, no, we have the thing that Kathy wants to buy. No, I have something that's even prettier that Kathy will be taken with. You know, that's fine. That model is fine. And that is the model that venture capitalists will use to describe what a benefit tailored advertising is. Mm -hmm. But as I said, for people who don't have a lot of spending money and they still want to extract money from those people, there's still, there's still a market there. Um, what is the market? What's it based on? And the answer is it's based on measuring and quantifying the kind of desperation people are living with. Are they desperate for a loan? Are they desperate to have a better life for their children, which was the come on by the for-profit colleges? And are they gambling addicts that you're going to take advantage of their addiction or other kind of addicts where you're going to like come on to them with something that will make it feel like they're partaking. It's like at the end of the day, it is only about money. It's not about pleasing, pleasing people. Um, and it is a race to the bottom because payday loans who are more predatory will have more money to spend in an ad auction than, um, than like better, uh, like what are they called? credit unions that have reasonable loan, uh, a, like interest rates. They're, they don't have, they cannot compete on a Facebook ad auction. Uh, you know, so it's one of those things that it's like, not only is it a machine, but it's a, it's a nasty machine for those people, for those people. And by the way, Angela, it's really important to, to, to remind ourselves that those people for whom it is predatory and a very nasty experience and they get trapped and tricked are not the ones that orchestrated or created this system in the first place. They are not the people that built the ad auction machine. Um, so it's like those, those are the, the, the people that are most harmed, but least they have the smallest voice. Yes. Yes. Um, I can see that, um, <clears throat> but is the answer then to, to, to say, loans shouldn't uh ads shouldn't be targeted to people who don't have to who don't have money to spend or is there some natural is is there going to be a natural uh you know optimization where of course people who have money to spend become more targeted or products products migrate in a, uh, and evolve in a different in a different way and evolve to different to uh, to advertise in different places that's a great question and I, I want to be fair to Facebook I think Facebook has said that they will not lo no longer let payday advertisers onto their system and I think Google has some rule about that too I you know the answer is we either have to change the the business model of the internet um which delivers us this tailored mm -hmm. advertising mm -hmm. um for in exchange for our attention or we have to make the rules strong and keep them strong and enforce them mm -hmm. and it's tricky as you pointed out just the same thing that you pointed out for politics like saying all political ads have to be banner but then what about black lives matter uh ads mm -hmm. same thing goes for these kinds of things you can sneak in something that doesn't on its face look like a payday loan advertisement but is in fact a payday loan advertisement once you click mm -hmm. on it so it it's really going to be a game of hide and seek um between savvy regulators and um creepy uh predatory companies mm -hmm. and systems mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I don't expect this to be resolved anytime soon for as long as we have the uh the ad based uh, internet Okay, so I think that the that the that the this uh, we can end with the same thing we started with, with that, which is I think that that models uh, uh, there is no one model for 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 everything. There's not even a, a, a model for how to solve these 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 problems and, and address them. <laughs> yeah, well, I think. Um, sorry, my dog wants to go out. Um, I think my conclusion is that um, the the meta model, at least in this context, is capitalism itself. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and uh, you know, we there is no magic um, other model that will fix the problems that capitalism creates. AI doesn't solve okay. every problem, and AI doesn't solve capitalism.